at, I'm going to talk today about conservation and management of birds. Um, some, well, first off, I should thank a whole litany of organizations for funding and collaborators. You know, through this, it's, it's not just me. So there's I have a very large lab, a lot of collaborations with different universities, different governments around the world. Um, you know, my lab is, um, we do all kinds of stuff from studying whipple whales, which I'll we'll talk about today. We have some research on meadowarks, field sparrows, um, soras and Virginia rails. We're using eBird data, so lots of different projects. But um, today I'm gonna talk about what is limiting a bird's ability to migrate. Is migration a bottleneck in terms of survival? for uh, individual birds, the location of key stopover locations, and kind of relate this back to conservation and management. And so in, in this corner, you can see that, you know, a lot of birds we know breed in our area, but then go other places. So we need to understand what we call the full annual cycle. And um, this evening, I'm gonna talk about some research we did on small birds, like, excuse me, this red-eyed vireo. Um, some work we're doing right around your neck of the woods, just south of you guys at Sand Ridge State Forest by, kind of between uh, Pekin and Havana. And then um, a bird that people don't think a lot about or when they think about it, they don't like it very much. Some interesting research we've been doing on Canada geese. So this is the distribution of the birds that breed in Illinois where they spend the winter. So as you can see, you know, we can do everything we can to maybe help population dick thistles in Illinois. But if they're all declining because what happens in Venezuela where our efforts are, are for not. And so we have to understand not only their breeding in Illinois, but also where they're spending, where they're migrating through and where they're sp spending the winter. And so we know on the breeding grounds, birds like this, this is Swainson's thrush, have high, high breeding um, survival. So greater than 95%. And then in the case of Swainson's thrushes, um, many of them winter in uh, Brazil, and we know their survival is pretty good. And we think what's why their overall survival is not very um, great is because of um, their survival during migration. So the first study we're going to talk about is a study where we used telemetry and we tagged birds at Fort Morgan Peninsula in Alabama. This is near Gulf Shores, and uh, not very far from Dolphin Island and Mobile, um, Alabama, and. Um, we tracked them as they went across the Gulf of Mexico, and we set up a series of towers across the Yucatan Peninsula. And so this was a large collaboration with several different organizations. And my main part of this was doing the work in Mexico. Um, and then lately, we're, we've been helping out with the work in um, Alabama as well. And we're using what's called automated radio telemetry to do this. So we've tagged, now it's way more of the, like, probably over 400 birds in Alabama. We use um, towers like this with multiple antennas, and that way we can get precise information on when they leave, where they're going, what direction they're going, when they depart. We can also, we're putting a little transmitter on here. We can determine fat loads. So many migratory birds, um, they store their fat kind of on the outside of their body cavity. And so if you blow on them, look between their feathers, you can determine how fat they are. And that's gonna be important here in a second. So we worked with several species, but the primary ones were red-eyed vireos, Swainson's thrushes, and wood thrushes. Um, we like Swainson's thrushes and wood thrushes because they're a little bigger birds and they can carry a slightly bigger transmitter that lasts a little longer. But we also worked with hummingbirds. So this was obviously quite the challenge. You got to put a super small transmitter on a hummingbird to track it. And so there went, a lot of work went into this. And these are 0.2 gram transmitters. They only last for maybe five days before the battery runs out, but it gave us uh, interesting um, data on whether ruby the hummingbirds even attempt to migrate across the Gulf of Mexico. So we had to develop a system down in the Yucatan that from materials that we could buy in the Home Depot in Cancun. And so we're lucky that University of Illinois has a very accomplished engineering program. And so we work with some professors of engineering to develop kind of a new type of antenna that can be essentially made from parts that I could buy at Home Depot. And then we put these together out in the, you know, tropical rainforests and little Mayan villages and put these up in order to track. And our main question was whether or not they arrived in Yucatan. Um, if they did, how long it took them to cross the Gulf of Mexico? So that's about a thousand kilometers. And then if, when they arrived in the Yucatan, did they land or they keep on going? So again, they're coming kind of straight south. Um, we do have a little bit of work in Cuba 
that we were never able to get a tower in Cuba. And for political reasons over the last several years, it's been difficult to work in Cuba, but we're hoping that eventually we'll get back to Cuba. But for right now, we're just looking at the birds that come through the uh, Yucatan Peninsula. And so the data looks like this. So we can't pick them up over the Gulf. It's only when they get near the land. And so this one is coming in, flying along, and then something like this happened where it disappeared. That means it landed in the forest. So if they land in the forest, because of all the water and the leaves and the trunks of trees, it attenuates the signal. So you can think of this as like an AM signal, like radio in your car. And so as you go under an overpass or you go down a hill, sometimes the signal goes away. It's the same, same idea with the transmitter signals. And so I'll give you some idea what we would do. So in this case, we tagged 136 Swainson thrushes. Of those, we got departure bearings. So everything worked well on our technology for 120 of them. Of those, a little over half actually went south over the water, which will be important. We'll talk about that here in a little bit. Of those, we detected 38 in the Yucatan Peninsula. And of those 38, 21 did direct flights. So some of them fly out over the Gulf and then chicken out and then come back. Or they might go to over toward Florida or over toward New Orleans and then go, and then go south. Um, and so we're able to get a, a really good idea of the behavior of these birds as they cross the Gulf of Mexico. And so there's a lot of data here, a lot of information, but I just want to two big things. Turns out wind is really important. And so they like to have a tailwind, as you might expect. So if they're going to fly 1,000 kilometers over the Gulf of Mexico. You don't want to fly into a headwind. You want to have a tailwind. And then secondly, fat is very, very important. Um, and so most of the birds um, that go south are very fat. Um, they know how fat they are, and they make appropriate decisions, which we'll talk more about here in a second. So we detected about overall 16% of the red-eyed vireos, 31% of swing thrushes, 20% of wood thrushes. And no matter what the bird is, it took them about four, 20 uh, hours across the Gulf of Mexico. So they're flying you know, somewhere around 50 kilometers per hour, roughly, um, to get across there. And, and um, you know, this makes some sense you know, after we collected the data. But before we collected this data, no one really knew how long they would take to get across there. And so it's quite, quite the feat. And here's some model data. We're able to do this because there's lots of cool atmospheric models on how the wind speed is. So the bigger uh, circles mean they're migrating probably faster because they have a tailwind. And these are individuals. The other thing I want to point out from this is we would have birds, like two red vireos. We tag them the exact same day. They would be in the exact same tree. They all migrate right at dusk. So all birds pretty much migrate at night. And so as soon as the sun goes down, they fly up in the sky and they head in the exact same direction. And then one of them land over here by Merida, and I want to land over here by Cancun, um, three hours apart. So birds are making individual decisions as they migrate. So you might see flocks of birds migrating, but except for in the cases of maybe waterfowl, these birds are primarily making their own decisions. They might use information from others, but primarily they make their own decisions. And it makes some sense because obviously if you make a poor decision, your wife's uh, hanging in the balance. Here's the locations where we detected birds in the Yucatan. And um, one thing you notice is there's none around here. This is a kind of a dry agricultural area in Yucatan. As you go from west to east in Yucatan toward Cancun, it gets much wetter. And so a lot of the birds are coming into this more moist tropical rainforest. Um, and this again will be important in a second when we talk about working with the Mexican government on where to put wind power. So we did a lot of other research, but I'm just gonna jump to um, survival. So in this case, we, um, Antonio Celes, one of my PhD students and I, were on an island called Isla Contoy, which was out in the Caribbean Sea, and the Mexican government forgot to pick us up. So we were stranded on a, on a beautiful island, but it wasn't so beautiful because we didn't have food or water. But in the morning, we just slept on the dock. Um, we, I walked around and found this bird right here and several other birds floating up to shore. So this is the Pathanchary Warbler. So this bird almost made it across the Gulf, but ran out of fat and then fell into the water. And so you'll see this as we took a boat out to this island, birds are flying along and then they're getting lower and lower and lower until eventually they just cannot stay out of the water and they fall in the water. And so we wanna try to understand what's causing, um, what affects survival as they cross the Gulf of Mexico. And then maybe we can do things to help, help these species. And we know that survival is bad going across the Gulf because there was a study on the gut contents of tiger sharks and they found that the top um, gut contents were like tanagers and cuckoos and warblers. 
And obviously these sharks aren't jumping out of the water to eat these birds. These birds are dying and then getting scavenged at the top of the water by these sharks. So we know a large number of birds do die as they cross the Gulf of Mexico. So this is kind of a fancy graph. I'll go uh, explain it. Um, on this axis, we have a survival. So one means your chances of surviving are 100%. This we have the fat score. So zero means you're emaciated. You have not a stitch of fat on your body. And five is what we call a butterball. So there's full of fat. And then on this line, we have wind profit. So zero means no wind. Positive numbers mean wind. So if you're fat and you got some wind behind you, you got pretty much a 100% chance to make it across Gulf of Mexico. And in fact, you could probably make it a lot farther. And we have some um, evidence that these birds might be flying all the way to Columbia. Um, someone asked a question about do birds fly at night? Yes. So all the birds I'm talking about today, except for geese, so all passerines migrate at night. They fly, usually fly up in the sky right at dusk, and they usually stop flying depending on what they're over sometime in the early morning hours. And the birds fly at night to avoid hawks and because it's very um, energetically costly and it's usually more humid at night and water is a limiting factor. And so if you migrate at night, you have more humidity. So energetically, you can make it farther. Also, we know that um, day of year is important. So um, if you're all bird watchers and you go out in Illinois, you know that you know in the last couple of days, yellow rump warblers have moved in, white-throated sparrows have moved in. And the other warblers have pretty much left. Bay breast, such as the black burnians have all kind of moved on. So down in the Gulf Coast, this is for Swainson's rushes, there's a peak right around October 1st when these birds come through. And what's going on is before then, there's lots of food. These birds are eating berries. And but as you go along, the berries go away, right? But as you go later in the year, you get better wind. So they want um, tailwinds, right? Which are come from northern fronts, like we're experiencing, you know, the last couple of weeks when we had these fronts come down, chilly air. Those, a lot of times those fronts make it all the way across Gulf of Mexico. So you have this sweet spot where, you know, especially if you're, if you're fat, you're going right in the sweet spot right around October 1st. And these Nortes, these, these um, cold fronts come from the north, we know are going to change the climate change. And I know that's hard to read this, but essentially um, what's going to happen is these Nortes maybe actually get more common, but they're going to be shorter in duration which means birds need to be fat and ready to take advantage of these Nortes in order to get there, get across the Gulf of Mexico. So how risky is crossing the Gulf of Mexico? Well, it's all conditional on fat and wind. Um, tailwinds and fat, it's really not that risky at all. Individuals know their condition. We never, almost every bird that went across was a four or five, so fat birds. Three is kind of intermediate. We've had a couple that left and we never saw them, so they probably um, didn't make it. And all zero ones and twos aren't even tried. They actually reverse migrate. We'll talk about that in a second. So there's significant conservation implications. We really can't do much about wind, but we can do something about fat because fat comes from stuff like this. You know, planting trees in your backyard that have berries, have insects, so birds stay fat the whole way down. So we're doing this research here. So this is Gulf Shores, this is Pensacola, Mobile, Dolphin Island. We have all these towers along here. And early on, we realized a lot of birds were migrating back north. So what was going on? So these dots represent some birds. So what they would do is they'd fly back north into, this is the Five Rivers Delta. And then they'd feed in these big forested areas for eight to 11 days. And then they migrate back over our towers and head to Mexico. And so one of my collaborators and my postdocs, TJ Zinzel now works for um, USGS down in Louisiana. And they got some deep water horizon money um, because we're not gonna be able to restore habitat along the Gulf Coast. The habitat's pretty much destroyed by condos and all kinds of other development. The land's too expensive, but we can protect riparian areas that the birds know to go to and they can get fat and then they can go south. So in this case, re detouring means they went around the Gulf of Mexico, retreating when they went north and uh, advancing when they went south. So you can see in many species, they're detouring around the Gulf of Mexico or they're retreating because they're not fat enough. And so it's not that they're gonna get fat at the Gulf Coast, they get fat in your backyard just as much as they get fat down there. And so it's one of these things where we need to provide the habitat so these birds can be fat as they go south. So lots of birds crossing gulfs. Again, they prefer tailwinds. They like to be fat. And uh, under good conditions, crossing the Gulf of Mexico is really not a challenge for them. I, um, talking about hummingbirds, and this is a, theoretically, if you do the math on how much fat they can have, 
they can cross the Gulf of Mexico, but it looks like most of them go around. And so this was a bird we tracked. And what's going on with these birds is they're bouncing between retirees' uh, trailers or houses along the Gulf Coast going to hummingbird feeders. In fact, somebody got such good picture of the band on a hummingbird. And I'm telling you, these hummingbird bands are super small that we were able to determine the number. This was taken in Corpus Christi, Texas. And we, and from other information, we've determined that these birds are actually spending a month flying around the Gulf of Mexico as opposed to going across it, which probably is a good choice because they're really at the cusp of whether they can make it or not across the Gulf. If they ran into any rain or any bad weather, they'd probably all die. And so they're just, and they're taking advantage of a new resource, that being hummingbird feeders all over the place. So we did this research um, and we noticed there was some people had talked to us about some wind power. And then several years ago on a Friday afternoon, I got a call from a person with the World Bank. And they had said that they were giving money to Mexico because Mexico wants to go um, to all renewable energy. And he was a bird watcher out in New York. And he realized that we were doing research and we needed to determine where to put some of these up. Um, one area was Cozumel, which is an island we work at off the coast of Can um, not very far from Cancun, off of Playa de Carmen. And um, we were able to use our data to tell them, all right, put the wind power in that area with no birds were going through the agricultural area. We we're also able to work with him because the largest flamingo colony in North America is down there as well. And flamingos are terrible flyers and they would get chopped up by these wind power. And so, you know, wind power is good for the environment in terms of uh, carbon emissions, but it can be problematic for migratory birds. And so we were able to work with them, which was rewarding to um, place these in areas that had the least amount of impact. All right, so now I'm gonna jump to a whole nother topic. So um, again, if you wanna write questions, I can answer them if I see them or answer them at the end. So we're gonna jump from this research we did in the, in the uh, Gulf of Mexico to research we're doing not very far, at least a lot of it's not very far from you guys. It's Sand Ridge Forest, which is just south of you guys on the Illinois River. Eastern whippoorwills are showing huge declines. And I'm not gonna talk about all the research we have going on right now. I'm gonna talk about the migration part of it, but I'll explain this figure just to give you a sense. So over the last few years, we've been going out and doing surveys, all these spots. So the spots that are kind of this bluish color means there's still whippoorwills there. And the spots with the X means there's no longer whippoorwills there. So in fact, my dad lives right here in Morgan County. And when I was young, we had whippoorwills and now there's no longer there. And then I'm over here in Champaign County and they're all gone from here. This number is the relative variance. It's essentially an index of how many moths are there. Um, and so what we're finding is as you can see right here, the top spot is Sand Ridge. Um, oh, this is Sand Prairie Scrub Oak and Sand Ridge, and they have lots and lots of moths. Um, so essentially what it comes down to is if you have moths, you have whippoorwills, at least in Illinois. And we have a, another big project starting this year, um, looking at why, what controls where moths are and how does nocturnal light pollution affect them and potentially have pesticides protect them. Um, but we're not gonna talk about that right now. I'm gonna talk about their migration. So um, we, it could be that they're declining because where they spend the winter, but we didn't really re really know where they did spend their winter, right? Whippoorwill is a tough bird to study. You know, it's nocturnal. It's, uh, you know, it's not super common, but there are some areas we can get quite a few. And so this was a collaboration with Ohio State University. The student that worked on this was Aaron Skinner. And we did a lot of the work um, collecting as well. And so what, we're, what we wanted to know if there was what's called migratory connectivity. So birds like rose-breasted grosbeaks that breed in the Northeast all winter down here, the ones around us winter in Guatemala, um, Belize, those areas, and out West, they winter somewhere else. Whereas green-winged teal, which are a mess, right? You know, the ones that breed North of us, they could go anywhere, right? And so if you have strong connectivity and say you're having huge deforestation going on here, this might affect the birds that are breeding in the Midwest. And so we wanted to understand connectivity. So we went out and caught whippoorwills at night. Um, these are our sites in Illinois. We have Salem Springs, Sand Prairie Scrub Oak, and then Sand Ridge. We also worked in the Ozarks and we did work up in Northern uh, Wisconsin and then Ohio State worked in Ohio. So we put out 115 tags, which are GPS tags and they're archival, which means you got, you got to get them back to download the data. So the next year we went out and really killed ourselves trying to catch the same birds again to see where they went. But we were able to get 58 of the 115, which I thought was really good considering um, 
you know, these birds have gone a long ways and, you know, over a year, some are going to die, some are going to do with different spots. And this is the data. So the birds in Illinois all go down to southern, West, uh, southern Mexico in the states of Chiapas and Oaxaca. Pretty much the same for Missouri, Ohio, and um, Wisconsin. So essentially, they're going down to southern, southern um, Mexico and then parts of Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador. Interestingly, they all go around the Gulf. They don't go, they don't go over the Gulf and they all go through this area and they're stopping over, like they'll fly and stop either four to 15 times on their voyage down to their wintering grounds. We also identified a key area where a lot of them are stopping over and that's the Wachita Mountains in Arkansas, Oklahoma and Texas. Uh, and it happens to be this last week is when they all are going through that area. There's a really tight cluster no matter where they're at, Wisconsin, Ohio, Illinois, they're all kind of in that area all at the same time. And the epicenter of that is East Texas. So up in this area, kind of about a 150 kilometers east of Dallas. And this is just a map of a loss of land in, in uh, Texas. But that area probably still has quite a bit of habitat and maybe lots of whippoorwills. We actually work with the Army quite a bit at Fort Hood, Texas, which is right about here. And so I have some of my crew down there out there right now, maybe even right the second at night, um, looking for whippoorwills as they migrate through the area. Someone asked how we catch a whippoorwill. So they're actually really easy to catch. Um, you can use playbacks and they'll fly into a mist net. We can catch them that way. Or um, they're not super bright. So you can like sit by a stump and wait till it lands on the stump and either reach. I actually seen grad, my grad student reach around, grab it by hand, or we use like a butterfly net and catch them. Um, I was worried when we started the research, it'd be hard to catch them, but um, they can get pretty smart. We have a couple birds um, down at Sand Ridge that know we're coming and they're, they're hard to catch. But generally speaking, they're not too hard to catch, at least in the terms of birds. So again, all these birds are going through this area in early October, right about now. Um, interestingly, even in Illinois, a lot of the birds just left a couple weeks ago. Um, you know, they stopped vocalizing quite a bit. And um, uh, so we think they might not be there, but they're actually there. And then they'll start migrating south. And some other research from, so whippoorwills are now endangered in Canada. And so there's been some work in Canada over the last couple of years, and they find the same thing. They're all going to southern Mexico. So we also get data uh, in the winter about where they're at. And so we're able to get locations and then plot out their home ranges. I'm not going to go into a lot of the statistics on this, but essentially they like forest, which is not too surprising because they like forest in Illinois and throughout their range in eastern North America. Um, one thing that's really interesting that we're continuing to do research on is some of them have ridiculously small home ranges, like 0.3 hectares. I actually was working on data this morning on the home range of whippoorwills in um, Illinois, and they're somewhere in the neighborhood of maybe 20 hectares, maybe even more. So 0.3 hectares, I mean, they're not doing anything. Um, whippoorwills will go into what's called torpor, which is like the bird version of hibernation where they'll slow down their metabolic rate. And um, we think they actually, even though it's warm down there, it might be going to torpor. So we're working um, with a colleague. Well, we're just gonna start working with a colleague in Mexico on this. Um, this is just how important things are. So it turns out forest is really important. TRI is terrain ruggedness index. So this is a really rugged area. It might be that the rugged area actually have more forests because they're harder to log. But the take home is they like forest in, um, on the wintering grounds. And so there's lots of, so this, the area where they're wintering also has a lot of deforestation. So we need to understand the impact of that. And one of the big crops down there is coffee. And so we're starting some projects on understanding the value of shade grown coffee versus sun grown coffee. So we did that research and then we did an expedition right before COVID hit. Um, we got money from the U of I to go down there and try to catch these guys down there. So at that time, we didn't know all the locations, but we knew a couple. And um, the green are where these birds wintered, and the pink are where we went. Um, I mean, literally, we were super close to where this bird was. But um, we, just to cut to the chase, we had no luck. So it could be that we were needed to be higher in the mountains. There's quite a few birds on the Pacific Slope. We were more inland. Um, yeah, we essentially failed. But we're not letting that slow us down. We're gonna we're gonna head back here soon. Um, you know, it was tough work, right? So we're out in some really beautiful areas. A lot of time at night. Here's a picture of uh, one of my 
people with me taking a picture of a bird called a common potu. Um, we'd be up all night. We'd take out food. But then since we're in Mexico, we want to go bird watching in the morning. So we bird watch all morning. This is a black hawk eagle doing a display. And then we'd sleep for a few hours and get back at it. But I'm pretty convinced that these birds don't respond to playbacks in winter. We are doing all kinds of playbacks, which is weird because in Florida, they do. So we came up with nada, not a single bird down there, even though we know we were super close. So going forward, we're looking at a few other things. So we're going to collaborate with a professor in Oaxaca. Uh, actually, just talked to him today. Roberto, he was going to come up here in the spring for a sabbatical at U of I, but I don't think they're going to let him. So, um, But we're going to continue to work with him. Um, there is a bird called the Mexican whippoorwill, which could be a competitor. It doesn't migrate down there. And when we played Eastern whippoorwill calls, Mexicans would come flying in and try to take your head off. So there might be kind of competitive um, competition going on. And then again, coffee, right? So a lot of the coffee that is grown down there um, that comes to our, even our market. And so it could be that it's hurting the environment. So we're going to continue to understand competition with other night jars, both Mexican whips and then the common paraki, which also, once you play an Eastern whip will call, the paraki will fly right into you. Um, Try to understand elevational gradients. So it looks like they're using areas between 500 and 1,000 meters high. I mean, shade coffee is, you know, there's a lot produced there and maybe it's good, maybe it's bad for birds. We're going to go to Florida this winter and look at, in Florida, there's a population of whip wills that winter there and they vocalize in, in the winter. So we're going to go down there and look at them a little bit to see if we can learn something about them and then go back to Oaxaca and Chiapas. And again, they might be taking a slower pace of life. And so they might be going to torpor down there. So they're just hanging out and, you know, essentially chilling and they might not respond to vocalizations because that's just the way they are. So just a little bit, just to get you guys up to speed on the project we're doing this summer and next summer, we're looking at moth abundance, landscape competition, and then sandy soils. So one thing we've noticed is you guys are right about, I guess, right about here. So notice all these sandy soils in that Sand Ridge scrub oak area. Also, there's sandy soils in the Ozarks, in Wisconsin, and in Michigan. And then if you look at Nightlight, you see that you guys, so Peoria is probably what, that one right there? So this is where Sand Ridge is. There's not much nightlight in Ozarks, Wisconsin, and Michigan. And if you look at the, this is the current distribution of whip wheels from eBird data. You see that, you know, we still have some throughout your area on the sandy areas along the river. Ozarks, the sandy area in northern Missouri, parts of Wisconsin, parts of Michigan. Though, notice this area is gone. So if you go up here, this is a very sandy area, but it's also got lots of, not of lights at night. And we know whippoorwills don't like that. And if you look at the Breeding Bird Atlas, in the 80s, you had quite a few whippoorwills in that area, and now they're all gone. And so we'll be looking at, um, um, did I say nightlife? I meant night light. sorry. Um, so if uh, we're looking at where the moths are, Maybe sandy soils hold less pesticides, agricultural pesticides, because it moves through the uh, soil. Um, or maybe there's different plants in sandy soils. We don't really know. So we'll be doing that over the next couple of years. So I can come back and talk to you once COVID's over in a few years, and we'll have a much better idea of what's going on with these uh, poor whippoorwills that are just dis disappearing throughout Illinois and much of the Midwest. So whippoorwill's a really interesting bird, right? It, there's it's fun to study birds that there's not a lot known about. We're making discoveries all the time. Um, you know, it's sad because they're disappearing so quickly, but our hope is that we can figure out what's going on and then use this new information to move forward. So we don't know that much about whippoorwills, but you would think we know pretty much everything we need to know about Canada geese, right? I mean, there's a lot of them out there. They're important hunting species, um, but that's not necessarily true. So I had a PhD student just finished up He's now down at University of Arkansas Monticello, a guy named Ryan Askren, who we got some money initially to figure out why geese were flying in front of planes at Midway Airport. And then we took those funds and addressed a bunch of different things. But today I'm gonna to talk about geese migration. First off, I think it's important to realize that geese were extinct in Illinois. So back in the 50s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, there was no geese left in Illinois. A researcher from U of I, from the Illinois Natural History Survey, Harold Hansen, found the last population, which was a flock of geese in Rochester, Minnesota, and then they captured them, reared them back, and 
as you guys can see any day around here, they did a good job, right? So there's millions of geese now in the area when there was down to, I think it was 32 birds were left. So um, it's a recent phenomenon that geese are so abundant. They're causing problems with human wildlife conflicts. Um, we are actually testing out ways to try to get, get geese out of different areas. Every time they run into a plane, um, there's all kinds of lawsuits and ends up costing on average 16 million after the lawsuits are all done. That's why Midway and O'Hare were so keen on having us look at the, what's going on. Um, and you know they're kind of controversial. Here in Urbana, they did some culling. They killed a couple hundred geese at a park so they could do a prairie restoration that'd be successful. People were very upset, had memorials. Um, they were sending emails to one of my one of, one of my old master students is now the head of the um, goose permitting for the Department of Natural Resources, and he was getting emails about how he's it cursed them with the blood of the geese. And so people get very, either you hate them or you love them. They're very emotional about geese. But they're, they're important, right? So as you know, in the River Valley, you know, hunting is very important to a lot of the small towns along the River Valley. Um, it's very important for conservation because hunters pay, uh, a lot of the money from hunting goes straight into conservation. And so it's important to understand where they're at, how they're behaving. And so we plotted out geese around Midway and we, we figured out essentially it comes down to they were hanging out on top of factories on south of the Midway because we determined that geese in winter essentially sit there and do nothing and this um, get fat in fall and then sit there all winter and hope um, they don't, um, if they don't leave urban areas, they can't get shot because hunting is not allowed in urban areas. But um, what we really wanted to um, investigate was this odd behavior called molt migration. So um, if you haven't figured this out already, migration is energetically costly. It's essentially, caught, you gotta burn lots of fat. So most animals move from their breeding season um, to the wintering from cooler to warmer latitudes, at least in the Northern hemisphere. Um, however, some birds make this weird behavior where they'll migrate somewhere just to molt their feathers. And we're finding this more and more in, in birds, but geese are pretty, Canada geese are pretty exceptional in what they do. Um, they have what's called simultaneous molts. So they lose all their wing feathers at once, so they can't fly for maybe up to a month. And so if you can't fly, you want to make sure you're in a place where you're going to survive pretty well. And so they should select for areas with low predation and high forage quality because it's very energetically costly to regrow feathers. And so they need a lot of, of forage. And this only happens with non-breeders or failed nesters. Um, so if you're successful in having young, you can't leave them and, and just leave them behind. Though we did find two instances in Champaign where geese had young and they kind of blended their young in with young of another pair of geese. And then they flew away, leaving the other um, geese to take care of their young, which is pretty interesting and pretty clever by the geese really. So we're going to look at, um, well, we know that a portion of the temperate breeding Canada geese undergo long uh, molt migration. This is from you know, band recoveries. And there was some work done in Michigan suggesting there may be variation in, in who engages in these molt migrations. And the early goose season, so if any of you are hunters, they have a goose season that got over maybe a couple of weeks ago. And the whole purpose of the early goose season is to reduce problematic geese in urban areas by hunting them um, as they molt, as they migrate around from molt. So this is just some data on where they go. So we looked at molt migration, and these are birds we caught in Chicago or Toronto, and this is how far they're going. And we'll talk more about this in a second, but they're going up to Hudson Bay. So we want we wanted to look at the effects of landscape competition composition on the propensity to molt migrate. So you know what habitats you're around. Differences in the behavior and length of flightless, flightless period, like so how long can't they fly? And then survival of birds that molt migrate versus birds that don't molt migrate. So again, we caught birds in Chicago in winter and then some in other areas, um, primarily around Champaign, but also like toward DeKalb. And then we worked with the Canadian government. They have a big problem with geese in Toronto, so they work on this project as well. Um, USDA manage some nests, so they go out and oil eggs, which means the eggs won't hatch. And so they provided us a bigger sample size of birds that failed to, to produce young. Um, we were able to get nest locations based on GPS data, when they incubate, whether successful or not. 
Um, lots of cool maps. I'm plotting these guys out over time. Um, and then we were able to digitize, I won't go into much about this, digitize where the surrounding land use around them. So they in an urban area, agricultural area, near a forest, near a wetland, those kind of things. And we're able to get at behavior through, so essentially what these geese have is they have a cell phone on their neck. Um, so this cell phone gives us a GPS location and it has what you guys would think of as a Fitbit. We call them accelerometers. So they give you um, instantaneous movement on X, Y, and Z axis. And so you can take that data and turn it into what they were doing. Just like your phone tells you how many steps you do in a day, the same kind of thing can be used to determine how much geese were flying, sitting, swimming, all those kind of things. And with that, we could quantify flightlessness. Here's one of the, of the units. So these are expensive. So they're about $3,500 for these. We got to buy data plans, you know, through Verizon or whatever. And so they're expensive. Um, and interestingly, you know, people, hunters are, very often want to um, shoot birds with bands. It's a big thing with hunters is shoot banded birds, which is fine. Um, but a lot of times they don't want to give this, this back. And so my student would track them down, right? So they'd find them on Facebook or something like that, bragging about hunting on some hunting. Um, and then we get a hold of them and say, and they say, well, I don't know what you're talking about. And we would say, well, I know you live at this address and I know the transmitter is in your kitchen right now uh, because we still get the data from them no matter where they go. And they'd always give it back to us. So we actually had fake we had these uh, transmitters, but they didn't have the innards, right? And so because all they want is to put it back on the bird, right? So when they mount it on the wall, which is fine. And so we give them that. We actually give them a map of where these birds migrated to and get all these things back. Um, and so with all this data, we could estimate survival. This is a fancy way of estimating survival, but um, just, um, yeah, take my word for it. We estimate survival. So we um, determined the fate of 206 nests and um, 49 instances of non-breeding. So across all these, 33% of the non-breeding birds, the birds that failed to breed in a given year, undertook molt migration. So a third of them did. And interestingly, that wasn't like a program thing, right? So 14% molt migrated in both years. 61 didn't do it in either year, but 25% switched between years. So they're making active decisions each year on whether to uh, molt migrate or not. And so what comes out as a number one thing going on is if you breed around lots of cropland, corn or soybeans, you molt migrate. And we'll get to this, but essentially why this is, is they can't really feed in corn and soy during the summer when they're breeding, right? There's, I mean, there's not much to eat there. Um, and so the rest of these wetlands are really important too, but they're a really small aspect of our, of our composition in Illinois now. Also, there's a big difference in the probability of molt migrate. So birds in Wisconsin, almost 75% of them molt migrated. In Illinois, we got 45%. In Toronto, it's you know 20. And then in Thunder Bay, Ontario, hardly any of them molt migrated. So there looks like there might be some genetic or cultural differences there, which may make some sense because when they reintroduce geese, they're just kind of haphazardly caught geese and moving them around. And so some may molt migrate, some uh, don't. Geese have been introduced all over the world. So right now we're trying to figure out if the geese that have been introduced in England and New Zealand molt migrate. So potentially the ones in England could, molt, could migrate to Norway or somewhere in the Arctic. I don't know where they go in New Zealand, but we're still trying to, to pin down if that actually happens, trying to find ornithologists down there that can help us. So this is their migration. So no matter if their nest, so most geese start breeding, you know, around you guys pretty early, right? So they can be breeding in April or May, but even if they lose their nest early, they kind of wait until the first few days of June. And then between June 6th and 9th, in three days, they migrate all the way up to this area. The ones in Toronto, the same thing, except they're going to the other side of Hudson Bay. In the fall, that's much broader. Um, so take, they cover a broader area and it takes them long. They kind of aren't in as big a hurry to get back. Interestingly, no matter what year we look at this, they always migrate about the week before um, goose season starts. Uh, it's almost like someone's telling them to get going because goose season is going to start. But still, quite a few of them get shot during goose season because some of them get a little late. And the goose season um, in Ontario, there's indigenous tribes that don't have to abide by goose season. And so they have got a couple of our birds over the years. So the amazing thing to me is, think this is Ryan with a goose up in Chicago. Here they are across on Lakeshore Drive. So you got these geese hanging out on Lakeshore Drive, Michigan Avenue, you know, downtown Chicago. And then three days later, 
they're in Hudson Bay dealing with polar bears, right? So an amazing change in environment and, you know, the fact that they're able to adapt to this that quickly and then vice versa, right? So they're hanging out in Hudson Bay until September and then they fly down and land, you know, on Midway Airport or some place like that. And so, you know, their ability to deal with these big changes is pretty amazing. So here's the data from the accelerometry data. And so here we have foraging. So they actually forage a lot more in subarctic, which is Hudson Bay. This is even accounting for the fact that they got like 22 hours of light that time of year up there. Um, they're just feeding like crazy. And then when geese put their neck up like this, it means they're alert, it means they see predators. So they actually don't see that many predators up there. And so essentially it's a good place to be, right? You're eating a lot, but we thought that would translate into flying at an earlier point. And so the ones in temperate areas fly, um, takes, their flight was about 30 days. The ones in the Arctic are about 55 days. However, this doesn't necessarily mean they're completely flightless. It could be that they have feathers and they just choose not to fly. Um, survival, what we see is overall, they end up being the same, though um, more birds that molt migrate get harvested. 13.4% um, got harvested, where it was only 3% got harvested if they were temperate molting, mainly because they're in urban areas where you can't hunt. But one thing to keep in mind, too, is we don't really know what their body condition is. And it's probably likely these birds in the subarctic, when they come back, they're in much better condition, really fat. And I'm not going to talk about it today, but that's how they make through the winter. So last year, essentially, they get fat and they hang out on top of rooftops or on, on ponds. Last year, when that big um, cold hit, we had six birds just freeze and die, which is kind of interesting. If you look at the data, they're just kind of sitting there. The next thing you know, they just fall over dead um, from freezing to death. Um, but the trade-off is if they were out, if they weren't in towns and they migrated south to Kentucky or southern Illinois, their chances of being shot are pretty high. So again, this is a, a, a bird up at Hudson Bay. So this bird was flightless, but you can see it's walking all over the place. It's probably, I mean, maybe it's not in a big hurry to grow its feathers, but it's probably a good place to be. So the propensity um, for molt migration is affected by graze lawn. So they can't graze in corn and soybeans in June. They're just too tall, right? And so they're moving to areas where they can graze on, either they're on golf courses or in urban areas where they don't have to molt migrate, or they go to the Hudson Bay where they can eat, you know, all these rushes and sedges and other vegetation. There's probably also something to do with social dominance. So birds that have young are a lot more dominant. So they could get beaten up by those and then they decide to leave and go up to Hudson Bay. And then there's definitely some genetic and cultural impacts with geese, but it's hard to figure that out. Um, I already talked about this kind of easy living. So if they go up there, it's a pretty easy um, life. Uh, we get our data back from cell phone towers. And so we actually don't get, we, there's no cell phone towers by Hudson Bay. The first, we actually figured this out. The first, there's one just south of Churchill, Manitoba. That's where we get all our data from. And so we don't know, well, some birds might die up there. And so it's hard to get in a sense of that, but that doesn't happen very often. So most birds that we go by that tower near Churchill, we pick up coming back by that tower in Churchill. Also, this early goose season is out there to try to control goose in urban areas. But the fact is that most of the geese that won't migrate are in rural areas because they're near corn and soybeans. And so it has a disproportional effect on rural nesting geese, which can still be problematic and can be a nuisance species, but it's still definitely not, a, it's not a impacting um, urban geese. And I'm not gonna talk about today, but essentially every metric we have suggests that geese are moving more and more into urban areas and it's not gonna stop. Um, they're just gonna keep on moving to urban areas as, um, you know, as winters get more mild, as they figure out how to make it through the winter. Um, they're a pretty amazing bird in terms of figuring out how to make it through the winter. So these behavioral strategies to winter as far north as possible. They don't wanna migrate south because they don't wanna get shot. In winter, they use these, they essentially sit there in these safe urban areas. And I, as I already mentioned, they can't forage in standing corn. And so they have this kind of flexible uh, behavior that allows them to take advantage of a lot of different things we provide, right? So one thing we provide is in the fall, they can go out into newly picked corn. So right around here today, I saw this, where when people go out and harvest the corn, they're out there getting all the waste grain just to get fat. They get as fat as they can and then just sit around and sh shiver, but make it through the winter. So kind of wrapping this all up, what's limiting birds' ability to migrate? What's fat? Habitat affects fat. Well, you need habitats where birds can get fat and hunting, I guess, a little bit and geese. Um, is migration a bottleneck? Yes, 
I mean, we don't know all the details yet, but yet, but it's probably a very stressful time of life for all birds. And we identified some locations, right? Yucatan's important, East Texas for uh, for whippoorwills and you know geese have ridiculously high site fidelity. So one thing that we haven't published yet, but it's really clear from our data, is that if you live out in the country and you have a pond and you have geese sometime in October, every year they're the same damn geese. So these geese have ridiculously high fidelity to, I mean, the same day they'll land on a pond for you know four hours feeding and then get up and fly again. So in conservation and management, you know, we need to provide in your backyard, this is a service berry and a blue grosbeak, beak, places where birds can get fat. You know, there might be stuff we can do in terms of our choices in um, shopping, right? So shade grown coffee probably is much more beneficial to birds. Um, some of my colleagues have been in discussions with Starbucks, trying to get Starbucks to make, um, sell bird friendly coffee but apparently they wouldn't because it cost them 30 more cents or something like that. But we need to get that out. We need, it, we need to educate people on what choices they can make in their everyday life that are gonna benefit birds. And finally, uh, this is a picture during the height of COVID when we could only be outside the U of I and we were catching birds like this Magnolia warbler. And these are pretty much non-majors. In fact, this is a, she was one of our star gymnasts on the U of I team and uh, I think she was speech pathology major or something like that. But you know, educate people on the value of birds and appreciation to birds. And so as they go forward, um, they act in a way that's um, helping the environment. So with that, the beautiful goose, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, I'll get away from the goose. So here's a, this is some research. We were, we're starting some research on owls. This is not the owl we studied, but this is some work we had done up in um, Zach Zimbalg last winter. This is a great gray owl, uh, obviously in slow motion. There's some cool, as it goes, you'll see some cool stuff. But anyway, so I know I covered a lot of stuff. And so let me know. I see there's a question. Whoops. Here. Oh. Looks like my, uh, hold a second here. There we go. Um, what's the question here? So is goose angel wing heredity heritable or nutrition? Um, so that is nutritional. So they can't get the resources they need to um, grow good. Uh, it's costly to grow good wing feathers. Uh, I think it's, I know it's not a heritable thing. Some of the questions were coming in talking when you talk about migration, such as do the most of your migration flying at night and are wind currents much more favorable at night or other mm -hmm. cooling atmospheres? Or yeah, so that's a good question. The, so birds migrate at night. And I mentioned how it's cooler, so and there's more humidity, but also there's a lot less turbulence. So you would think that the more tailwind would be better for birds, but actually, if you get too much wind, you create a lot more turbulence, and it causes a lot more problems for the birds. So they like, you know, consistent but not super strong winds, and that's what you see at night, right? So during the day, when atmospheric warming, it causes a lot more turbulence. That's more difficult for the birds to migrate. That's why they. Um, um, that's why they uh, migrate at night. Uh, do you think researchers call playing is uh, significant enough to influence eBird observations? <laughs> um, well, I can tell you about that. So that's we're part of that study. So one of my uh, students, Chad, is in charge of the Sora and Virginia rail migration study. And we're getting some cool data. So several of the birds that we've tagged have been picked up in Canada, Minnesota, Wisconsin. Um, and you know those calls sound great. In fact, this is super secret, but they actually um, captured a yellow rail a couple of days ago. But um, um, we work with eBird data a lot, and um, the way eBird data is analyzed is super sophisticated. So even if every birder in Fulton County went over that way and reported a Sora, and there weren't actually there would probably be Soras there, but reported a Sora, it would still be controlled for in the eBird algorithms. That's a good question. At some point, I can talk to you about that, or I can send Chad over here. He's actually from Peoria to talk um, to them, to you guys about that. So um, they were playing. So in the spring, when you play vocalizations of Virginia and Soros, they come right into the trap. Um, so you didn't have to you didn't have to play the vocalizations very much. But in fall, we've learned that the vocalizations don't work very well at all. So we're probably going to stop playing it continuously in the spring or in the fall because they just don't care. Right. Um, I don't think it's affecting them at all. They just they just walk right by the trap and don't care. 
one person who is talking about all the whippoorwills is wondering how on earth do you catch a whippoorwill? Yeah, so um, as I mentioned, we use mist nets. So these are really thin nets that uh, we put up that they can't see. And then males are super territorial. So we play a whippoorwill call on an MP3 player and they come flying in to see who's there and they get caught in a net. And then for females, we walk around with headlamps at night in the forest and we can see eye shine of females on a nest. And then we just walk up with a butterfly net and put the net over the, you can walk right up to them. And then we pick them up off the nest. Um, so they've turned out to be actually a, one of the easier birds we can catch. Um, I didn't talk about it, but geese, are super hard to catch. So we'd have to dress up like a jogger um, up in Chicago and actually jog by them with a handheld cannon net that we hid like in our sleeve. And then we pull out this and it shoots out a net around the geese. If you walk up to them and like in usual clothes we wear as researchers, they see it coming a mile away. You got to dress up like a jogger. So it was, it was pretty interesting <laughs> to make them do that. <laughs> 